Welcome, everybody. This is the Food Fitness Finance Fun Blab, and my name is Kirsten. I am your host, and every week I am going to bring you an expert in one of those topics, either food, fitness, finance, or fun, to help you live your best life possible. So today we are going to be talking about fitness, and we're going to be talking about one of my very favorite subjects which is triathlon with one of my very favorite people on the planet, my friend, Wendy Mater. So hi, Wendy. Hi. Yay. So it took us a while to get this worked out. Um, so if you have to leave early, I will post the recording so that you can see all the rest of the stuff because we have some awesome questions and awesome information we're going to be giving you guys today. But before before we get started, I want to go ahead and read you guys a little bit more about Wendy, and she'll be talking to you um, a little bit more detail about her, her journey and her story, but I wanted to give you just some kind of an overview of who she is by reading her bio. So, Wendy is the co-founder and owner of T2 Coaching, and she has made a lifelong commitment to fitness, sports, coaching, and triathlon. From her youth as a competitive swimmer to her current career in the fitness industry, her dedication shines. Wendy is a former collegiate swimmer and has 20 years experience in triathlon, including- Now 25. Oh my gosh, you need to update your bio, Wendy. 25, including 13 Ironmans. Is that the right amount? 15. 15 Ironmans. She is the head coach for, oh, you're not, I should have read this before because I actually know Wendy. She's not the head coach anymore for the high school swimming. Um, but the three things I did want to mention that are really important, especially in what we're going to be talking about today is Wendy is a level two USAT certified coach, which is awesome. And she has been to Hawaii seven times, eight, eight times. And one year in 2008, she won overall female amateur in the entire Ironman World Championships in Kona. So this girl knows what she's doing and knows what she's talking about. So we do have some questions that I've gathered from some people who want to know stuff about triathlon, but we're going to get to that in a minute. What I would love first, Wendy, is for you to just talk to us about uh, why you started triathlon and your journey over the past 25 years in triathlon, what that has looked like. 25 years is a long time. I've never done anything for 25 years in my life. Um, and first of all, thank you for having me here. This is exciting. Um, I have a lot of experience to share and there's a lot of avenues we can go with, with questions. So hopefully we'll stick to the point. But 25 years ago, um, June, in June, it'll be exactly 25 years, I did a team triathlon. I was just the swimmer. I did a half mile swim and the, I had a teammate do the 12 mile bike and a teammate do the four, I think it was a four and a half mile run. And I was, it was just after my freshman year of college swimming. And I had really never really heard of triathlon. Even though my mom did triathlon, I really didn't know what she was doing because I was so young. So I did this team triathlon, um, dominated the half mile swim. It was my first open water swim ever. And kind of freaky, kind of icky. It was in Michigan. And um, I just sat and watched the rest. And I thought, okay, the next year I want to do the whole thing. And like I said, it was a half mile swim, a 12 mile bike and a four and a half mile run. So a year later, I had a $200 mountain bike that I toured around in town. I was in college. Um, I had some experience running track in high school and I swam since the age of four. So I just swam, biked and ran a lot. I didn't know how to train. I just did it. And then I did the sprint distance triathlon and I won my age group. Um, there were, I got 12th overall women and then won my age group. So I was hooked, hooked up to the Ann Arbor cycling team and they helped me buy a bike. So I got my first road bike and um, really the rest is history. Um, 1992 was when I started and, you know, there's just, there really wasn't a lot of information out there when I started. So I kind of learned it all on my own. Um, I really didn't understand training. I just like to do it. And it kind of got me through. Um, and then in 1997, I did qualify for my first Ironman, which happened to be in Hawaii, which happened to be my first marathon. And I finished 10th of my age group. So again, that got me on the path of doing Ironman over the years. 
So should I say more about that? Yeah. Yeah. What did you do? So you were just naturally, I mean, your first long race you did, you qualified for Kona. So you were Uh, naturally. Yeah, I mean, I started when I was 19 years old and there, my age group wasn't, 19 wasn't even part of an age group. Back then, the age group started at age 20. So starting at age 19 was really young. Um, I actually did qualify for Kona in 1995, but I turned the slot down um, or maybe it was 1993 and I actually didn't know what Kona was. And I actually turned the, so you, you were like, whatever. <laughs> um, I just didn't, I didn't know. And I turned it down cause I was a collegiate swimmer and I didn't want to risk losing my scholarship in college. So oh, yeah. it was at that age 22 that I decided, okay, I want to go when I'm 24. So I moved out to Colorado in 1995 for 300 days of sun. And, um, I ended up qualifying at a race called desert sun, half Ironman and grand champion, Colorado. And, um, like I said, I crossed the finish line and I cramped and I'm like, oh my God, there's no way I'm going to double this distance. But of course I qualified. I couldn't turn the slot down. I was 24. And, um, back then you you knew what it was by then. Yeah, exactly. So qualified, went to Kona, had a great experience. Um, unfortunately, but fortunately, um, I got, you know, I was the fittest of my life. I didn't want to stop training, came back for Kona didn't stop training, didn't take a break, didn't recover. And I ended up getting really sick. Um, for about another year, I was really, 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 really sick, like a chronic fatigue syndrome sick. Cause I didn't know how to recover. I didn't know anything about nutrition. And so it was really that moment that I decided kind of, kind of started my path towards coaching because I had to read every book of nutrition, homeopathic medicine training. Cause I never wanted to go through that sick experience again. And I had to figure out why I was into the sport. So um, in 1996, or sorry, 1998 kind of was my year to get healthy again. And then um, I knew because I did so well in Kona that I wanted to go back. But it took me a few years to get there again, because again, I didn't know how to train. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a coach. Um, I had sicknesses. I had to go through sickness and illness and injury and all that to kind of figure it out. And I didn't qualify again until um, 2003, actually. I didn't go back until 2003. And then I went back. um, It didn't, it took me, it took me till 2008. I think I had done five Ironmans before I said, okay, I want to go back and win this damn thing. And I went back in 2008 and won it. Um, But there was a lot that happened um, with my knowledge to, kind of figure out what I needed to do to get to that level. I knew I had what it it took to get to that level. I just didn't know how to get there. Right. Well, perfect. Because that's actually what makes you such a great coach is that you had to learn uh, by experience over 20 years before you really found or or 18 years until you really found what worked for you. And now that you know, it's easier to coach other people on it. Totally. I mean, any athlete that I've ever coached, I've been, I've had every, every injury I've been sick. I know I don't diagnose anything, but I've been there, done that. I know how to treat it. And I know, I know the signs and symptoms. I know what they need to do to overcome any um, downsides or anything that they're struggling with. I know because I'm still the athlete experiencing it. I'm the athlete coach. So the amount that I can relate to athletes is huge. Right. Right. And that, and that's huge in coaching because people want somebody that they can, that understands what they're going through. Exactly. Exactly. So I think when people ask me what sets you apart from other coaches is that I am the athlete with 25 years experience and I have 24 more years of experience I'm going to get. I'm still doing it. That's the great thing about triathlon is you can do sprint distance, Olympic half full. You can focus on swimming. You can focus on biking. You can focus on running. Um, There's no reason to get bored or burned out because there's so many different avenues you can take with triathlon, not just Ironman. Right. Yeah. I, I, I can't remember if we were talking about this last time we talked or the time before, but I, I thought I remember somebody telling me they got, they were bored of something and we were both like, how could they be bored? There's like so much to experience and do and so many avenues that you can take in triathlon that it should never be boring. No, it's definitely a lifestyle. Right. And if you don't like the lifestyle, you don't have to do it. 
to me, I chose yeah. life, to me, I chose the lifestyle. I made a career out of my passion and my, my hobby. Right. Good. Which is something that everybody aspires. Well, almost everybody aspires to do. Right. So congratulations on that. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, a couple, it's funny because I kind of put out there that I was going to interview somebody who's, you know, a coach and a, you know, elite athlete and, the, the questions I got, most of them were about nutrition. So I think people really are kind of stuck on their nutrition. Um, but before we go into that, because that's, you know, that could be like a three hour thing exactly. um, on nutrition alone. Um, before we go into that, I wanted to just ask you, since you are a coach and there's a lot of people who I hear, they're like, oh, do I need a coach? Why do I need a coach? When would I need a coach? So who who needs a coach? What type of triathlete needs a coach? Well, I, my target demographic is the first time triathlete, someone who's never done it. That's how I define a first time triathlete, the beginner who's never done it and who, who, who has to seek out the education. So my coaching is based on education. I like to educate the athletes. Um, to be able to hold themselves accountable and to really understand what they're doing. So if you're a very beginner into the sport and you've never done it, um, hiring a coach is the way to go because there's so much information out there. It can get very overwhelming. And a lot of times coaches kind of say the same thing, but in a different way. So developing that relationship with an athlete is really what coaching is. It's a, it's, you're developing the relationship and you're, um, you're holding that athlete accountable. That's why people hire coaches is so they can have someone on their journey with them. Um, I also really tailor towards the beginner intermediate Ironman athlete. So um, the Ironman athlete who's done an Ironman, but they want to get better. How do they get better? Or that triathlete who has a lot of experience who is doing an Ironman for the first time. So I think any athlete who needs that partner is, um, not the spouse, not the best friend, not the brother or sister, but they need that person who's a little bit non, not biased to go along their journey with them so that athlete can share um, their ups and downs because there's so much emotion that goes into training and racing, especially racing, um, pre-race, post-race, during race, that sometimes your partner or spouse doesn't really get it, but your coach does. And having that, having that accountability partner, which is what your coach is, is really good to have. So I think, I mean, really anyone, anyone, really everyone should have a coach. I really wish I had one when I started, but I, I am the coach I am today because I figured it all out on my own. Right. So everything happens for a reason. I mean, I think right. if I had a coach early on, I'd be at the Olympic Training Center. I would have went to the Olympics. I would have qualified for Ironman way earlier than I would have. But right. it wouldn't have made me the the coach that I am today. Right. Right. Because a lot of athletes, actually, when they retire from triathlon, become coaches. But they've had a coach their whole career. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so pros have coaches. They yeah, they have different, they have a totally different experience than what you, you had. Like you said, you had to figure it out on your, out on your own. And that's, what's made you the coach right, you are. Exactly. So, um, before we get into specifics, cause I know I always hear, you know, there's all the, there's a lot of blogs out there. There's a lot of magazine articles. Everyone always wants to know what the top athletes are are doing for training and uh -huh. eating and wearing. And, you know, that's why athletes are sponsored because people are going to look at you and say, well, I want to wear the shoes you wear because you're a fast runner, or I want to use the bike you use because you're a fast cyclist. Um, so, so we do want to hear some specifics because that's what people want to know. But I also know that you agree with me in saying that everyone is so different. And the best thing to do is, yeah, if you, if you like something Wendy says, or if you like something your friend says, who's also a fast runner, try it out, see how it works for you, and then adapt it so it fits into what your goals are and, and how you how your body is, how, you know, we're all right. so and, different. And you just said um, something, why does someone need a coach so they can focus on their program based on their fitness, based on their life schedule? All too often people say, oh, 
my best friend is doing this long run. My other friend is doing this long bike. Ooh, I want to join a master's group. I want to join the running club. I want to join the cycling club. And, and those people tend to get the most injured and the most overtrained because they're not following their personalized plan based on their current fitness. That is really the number right. one reason someone should seek out guidance from a coach. Right. Well, and also, like you just said, if you start, so this is a perfect example. I, on Wednesdays, I run with a friend of mine and um, after we swim and a couple other people from the swim group have said, oh, we want to run with you guys. So yesterday, no one did, but um, one of the girls that was going to run with us, I asked her, I said, oh, are you running with us today? And she was like, oh, I want to, but I better not because I decided to follow a plan and I should probably follow the plan. And I said, yeah, that's why you have a plan. Because if she's the type of person who wants to um, be run for social or run with people, she might have us running on Wednesdays, her other friend running on Thursday, her other friend runs on Friday. She wants to run with everything. Next thing you know, she has a stress fracture because she exactly. just ran every day. I mean, that's how I used to train when I started yeah. 25 years ago. I pull out, I pull out a workout from yeah. a runner's world. I pull out a work, workout from a cycling magazine. I put it in a scrapbook. I, and just yeah, I mean, them. I still have all that. I open it up. Ooh, which work I do right. want to do today? I didn't know what to do. No one told me right. anything. Right. And then you probably did your swims from yeah. college, which were like, you know, 10,000 exactly. meters. Exactly. And you know what? The, the best part about that, what I did was I'm still here 25 years later. So I got, I'm, I'm right. one of the lucky ones that is still doing this 25 years later from all the mistakes I made. Well, I just from knowing you, I would say you're not lucky, you're smart, and you listen to your heart. Because somebody asked, somebody wanted to know about like, um, your schedule, your periodization, when you recover, how many days a week do you work out? And I kind of laughed just because I know you and I know you listen to your body really well. And if you don't feel like you need a day off, you don't take a right. day off. Right. And I coach a beginner different than I coach an elite athlete. They're not that they're totally oh, not complete. the same. What I, right. you, no one will ever be like me. No, I don't even try to be because right. you won't be like me. Cause if someone's trying to be like me, I will do something completely out of their mind that they're not like me because I'm right. a unique person. <laughs> right. So let's get on the so, questions. Okay. I forgot. Yeah, let's get to a couple questions. Um, let's do. Let's talk just for a few minutes about that. Like, um, as far as when you put your training together, and, and you don't need to go into detail. Just in general, kind of, how do you periodize your year, your month, your week, um, and and talk a little bit about rest days and how many. Well, days I mean, generally, days. general periodization plan is you know the 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 most common structure and it's changed you can do reverse periodization you can do block training um there's different models now but generally you have this off season which happens in like the fall winter and then after you take some time off no one really takes time off anymore so i like to call it the out of season phase um you jump into what's called um, a general preparation phase um, which is usually, I don't know, eight, eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks, depending on who you are. And during that general preparation, you're preparing your body to train. And, and I, I follow this, but my, I, mine is probably way above and beyond someone else's general preparation. So what, I, what my focus is during the general preparation, it's a lot of core um, strengthening the area between my shoulders and my hips. It's a lot of um, dynamic movements, flexibility, functional strength training. While I'm doing that, I usually choose my sport um, running. I usually stick with running. I never take a break from running. And, and so that's my primary thing during my general preparation. Sometimes I'll get out for a ride, jump on my trainer. It just depends on the year and it depends on what my focuses are. Um, and then from that general preparation, you move into what's called specific preparation, which is more specific to, okay, let's get rid of the, the, um, the, the kind of the strength core stuff, let's maintain it, but let's not focus on it as much. And let's move into more biking, swimming, more of a triathlon training program that that's specific. That's why it's called specific preparation. And during that phase, I'm, I'm starting to really get into 
um, frequency, duration, and intensity leading up to my race. Again, that phase can be anywhere between 8 and 16 weeks. A lot of people know this preparation as kind of the base phase. Um, how I monitor intensities based on a series of time trials, uh, swim, bike, and run time trial with my heart rate and or power meter. So I gauge intensity doing a fitness test, and that's how I coach athletes. And then once you kind of move into the, prep, the competition phase, competition phase is usually about 8 to 12 weeks out from your, my most important race is when I start doing local competitions, less important races, um, and test out my training. Let's see if what I've been doing is working and let's get me up to that race intensity during that race specific phase. And then I go through a series of like for an Ironman, I'm really focused on Ironman specific intensity during that race, um, preparate race specific training phase. And so I get ready for my Ironman. If I wasn't doing an Ironman and I was just doing a marathon, I would do marathon specific training or sprint distance specific training. So I'm really mentally, physically ready to do my race. I know for me, because I've been doing it long enough, I know exactly what the outcome's going to be because of my training. I'm very confident and I try to get my athletes prepared and confident that they know exactly what the outcome is going to be of their race it kind of leads to less anxiety um, when they're that prepared. And then of course things happen. You got to juggle. You got to say, okay, I missed a day. I missed a week because of travel, sickness, family stuff. So then the art of coaching is having that coach kind of juggle your life schedule and kind of fitting your training around the schedule. And that's why it's so individual and so specific to each person. Did that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. And actually, while we were talking, while you were talking, a question came in um, that I think is a great question to answer. We can mm-hmm. we can both answer it. Uh, he says, "Have you guys ever encountered health problems as a direct repercussion of your intense training schedule?" And I would say, um, my kind of like Wendy talked about it when she was first talking. When I did my first Ironman, I was very clueless, and I took a training plan out of a book. But what I did was if I missed a workout, I would just make, make it up later in the week. And so, and so it was based on a block where it was three weeks of building one week of recovery. And so what I would do is anytime I missed a training and I was working like 60 hours a week. So I I missed, you know, a few long workouts a week. I would just add them at, write them all down. And then in my recovery week where I only had like 10 or 12 hours of workouts, I would just add all those in because I had all this time. And I was like, oh, this is great. So basically I trained, you know, five months or whatever it was with no rest at all. And I was working a lot. So right after my first Ironman, I I got super sick. Like Wendy was talking about, um, I had strep throat, I had an ear infection. I mean, in this all just was, I would say about a week after I finished the Ironman, just all these things. And then I ended up with a walking uh-huh. pneumonia and I was sick for about six months nonstop. And I know it was a direct result of over. Right. And, and, and only really health. And I'm lucky because it was just a, an overtraining thing happened after my first Ironman in 1997, but I learned from it. And yeah. And so I've had, like I mentioned, I've, I've had a lot of different injuries. Um, I haven't been injured since 2010 because I started working on my core, but no, I've never had any health issues due to my training. And I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, Over the years, I've learned um, what nutrition works for me. I've learned what kind of recovery works for me. I mean, I've just learned a lot. You, you, 25 years later, still doing it. You bet. I've overcome a lot of things that could have potentially happened. But um, right. because this is my lifestyle and I don't want anything to ever happen to me where I am where I was in 1997, I don't want that to ever happen. So right. I won't because of my education and my, my constant learning of, of what's happened to other people and how they've overcome something. Right. Yeah. And I actually, speaking of injuries, um, I was getting quite a few injuries And so I was barely running because I kept, I was afraid. I was like, I'm going to keep getting injured. And, but I learned from every single injury 
And when I started, I decided to start swimming more. Uh And so I started, I always kick with fins. I do a lot of breaststroke kick. I do a lot of things that counteract the running and biking. And I haven't been injured in the last five years. And I've increased my running exponentially, increased my biking. And I, the same thing, like, so my recovery, what I've learned about recovery is helping me. So I haven't been injured either. And mine is swimming. Like that's how I, how I do a lot of my, and mine is core, you know, you know, Kirsten knows I'm into programs like insanity beach body programs. As soon as I'm feeling something achy, usually in my hips, I start doing my core stuff and, and it goes away. So, I mean, I figured out something that works for me. And so I, I apply what works for me with other athletes. I just, you know, it's like I share what works for me and, and usually it's pretty much going to work for anyone. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's true because I mean, if you read any research on mobility and core strength and, you know, flexibility and all that, I mean, that's what they all talk about is you've got to train your core and keep it strong. It's it's the motor that affects the rest of your body. So, um, so yeah, so speaking of, I did have a couple of people want to know about what kind of things do you do for recovery? Do you do, um, do you get massage? Do you, you know, what my, other things do you do? And, and this is daunting to people. My recovery is nutrition and sleep. I don't, I, I get maybe, maybe three massages a year. I'm not a massage person. Um, I, I happen to work at a health club. So there's a foam roller and there's this thing called an inversion table. It's called the teeter. Um, That really stretches me out, but I'm not necessarily on a stretching protocol. I do more of that kind of stretching core work in my um, general preparation period, but I'm not a year round um, person that stretches when I'm feeling something. um, Maybe that's when I go get a massage, Um, but sleep, Sleep and nutrition, that's really, that's really it for me. I did actually a whole article. I, I questioned people about their best recovery, recovery practices and did a big blog and article about it. Um, and that's great. The boots, you know, those big no, no, no attack boots, people swear by um, certain recovery blends of drinks of product. But to me, it's just a lifestyle of, good nutrition, plant-based nutrition in my case, you're, you know, it's just my general nutrition practice. And, um, I sleep, I sleep well at night. Yep. And I recover and when I, I don't recover. It's cause I didn't have enough sleep. I'm a hundred percent there. Um, I, in one more question before we talk about nutrition, cause somebody just asked and we're talking about it is sleep. So, um, they wanted to know, do you ever have issues sleeping? Do you ever, find it hard to sleep because of everything you do or is it easy? No, the only, the only times I've ever had sleep issues um, was when I had a lot going on in my life and there was just a, just variety of life stress that we all go through. Um, You know, when there's just financial stress, stuff like that, that's the only time I've ever had sleep issues. But so no, no, but, but lack of sleep is like heavy training load and not sleeping. That's a sign of overtraining. And I'm sure that happened to me way, you know, 25 years ago, but um, I didn't know it. And so I would say, no, you know, right now I don't, I get my sleep at night. It's great. Oh, sleep is awesome. I'm a sleeper. All right. So let's talk a little bit about nutrition and I want to wrap it up in about 10 minutes. So we won't get too in depth Uh because again, nutrition is something we could talk about for years, Uh but Joey, stop. Joey wanted to chime in. Um, So why don't you just kind of go over, you said, you know, your uh, general plant-based diet. Why don't you walk us through your, not, not, um, not your race nutrition, but just your general everyday nutrition. Like what, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner on just a regular training day? And then during So nutrition has been something that I've struggled with a lot. Okay. Until I went plant-based. The reason I chose plant-based was, um, really in 2008, three months before I won the Ironman world championship, I wanted to cut cheese out of my diet and see if I could get as lean as I could get. And the only way for me personally to do that was to say, I I'm vegan. Never didn't really know what vegan was. I just knew they didn't need animal products and I was eating too much cheese. 
cut cheese out. I dropped 10 pounds just like that. It melted off my body. I had the race of my life. So I knew that style of eating was really good for my body and my mind. Um, and then I, 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 I kind of switched focuses because I like to try before I completely committed to plant based. I like to try different things in case an athlete asked me. So I went actually complete opposite and I did paleo for about six months. I, I had not eaten red meat in 20 years. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with red meat and it lasted six months. And then I'm like, okay, this isn't working for me. So I cut out all animal products except dairy. And, and then probably it wasn't till about 2011, 2012 that I was finally able to get the dairy out of my system and, um, and be plant-based vegan athlete. Um, and that just works good for me. I love to cook now. So I think part of my struggle in the beginning was I didn't have variety, but now that I like to cook, it's really easy for me to get all the nutrition that my body needs. So a typical day for me would be, um, wake up coffee, um, banana, peanut butter, and then I get my workouts in usually in the mornings. And then after a workout, I'll have a recovery shake. It'll be usually almond milk and either Shakeology or, um, this Aloha brand of protein that I like, but with other stuff in it, it could be veggies, it could be fruits, but it's just a different shake. So that to me, that's part of my breakfast. So I kind of split my breakfast in two because I'm a morning workout person. I never work out on an empty stomach. That's just not how my body likes to, to do it. Um, and then every three hours I'm eating. Um, if I'm not, I'm cranky. So my lunch is always some sort of humongous, humongous salad. Um, all the veggies. I'm a tofu tempeh eater. Um, that's I, I'm not scared of soy. Um, but that's my, I, I do have a, a higher soy intake cause I love tofu and tempeh cause I usually put that on my salad. Um, I'm eating kind of snacking on fruit. Most of the days I'm snacking on veggies. Um, usually my mid afternoon snack, it could be another shake, but it's usually veggies and hummus. Um, I'm looking in my cupboard right now. Dinners are usually some sort of bean quinoa, bean, brown rice. Um, if I hadn't had tofu or tempeh that day, I'm going to put that in with some sort of whole grain. Again, I'm looking in my cupboards. Sweet potatoes. You oh love my sweet God. Potatoes. Sweet potatoes are probably one of my, if I was on a deserted Island, I would not be without sweet potatoes. So I have my staples to what I eat. And I, like I said, I eat every three hours. I don't like being hungry. So I'm not going to let myself be hungry. I'm always prepared. Um, I don't ever expect anyone to go, above and beyond trying to cook dinner for me because I'm always prepared with my own thing. It's not a big deal to me. Um, and I'm not against what you eat either. Like to me, this is what works for me. And if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Yeah, that's, it's funny. I have a friend who I was talking to him last night about nutrition mm -hmm. and, uh, or yesterday afternoon. And, um, the first thing he said, he's like, can I ask you a couple questions about nutrition? I said, of course. And he said, just so you know, I don't, I'm not vegan. Well, he's not a vegetarian. He goes, I'm not vegetarian. Right. I'm like, that's okay. Most people aren't. <laughs> right. Most athletes aren't. And one thing about, one thing about, um, I have a plant-based recipe Facebook group that I share everything I make. I don't share a recipe unless I've made it. And because I've had this group going for three years, I don't really follow recipes anymore because I'm the one creating my own recipes because I've been cooking for so long. So that's another another way to learn and get more educated about plant based eating is is in through various Facebook books groups. Kirsten has one. I have one. Um, if you're interested in eating more plant based, that's great. We have a lot of different websites that we like to share with others about eating plant based. Um, it's just something that works for me. Awesome. So what about on your longer training days? Like if you were going to do a long bike or a long run, what does your, do you vary your general nutrition or do you keep that the same and then just add something during the long My run? general nutrition is always the same. Um, if I went on a three hour run or a three hour bike ride or something like that, um, I would just have bigger, I would have a bigger post workout meal and a bigger kind of dinner that evening. Um, general nutrition. I experiment with everything. Some, some years I like to just do my own dates and nuts and like real food, non-processed bar food. 
Um, I found some Aloha bars that I like. I found some Vega bars that I like. Um, Power Bar has these like applesauce type packets that I like that are plant based. Cliff Bar has stuff. So I, I do like to use the um, um, nutrition that's out on a race course to practice with because I don't like to carry my own stuff. And I, I really, I can just eat anything and go. I have a really strong gut. I don't have GI issues, but I do like to make my own energy drink. Um, I save the Gatorade for race day. I'm on a, I'm, I like Gatorade, but I'm not going to drink it until race day because I know it works for me. So I don't have to practice with it. Um, again, I'm looking in my cupboard to see what's in there. I, and again, cause I eat before my long rides and long runs. I don't feel a lot during them. Because I've been doing this for 25 years. I'm, I'm very efficient. Your body's I'm very, very efficient, efficient. Yeah. But generally speaking, every 45 so, minutes, I'll put something in my mouth. Okay. And so, and so for race day nutrition, you said you just use what's on the course, so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to Right. And it's usually about, for me, it's about 200 calories an hour. Okay. And so I know you get this question a lot, and uh -huh. I get it a lot. I, but I want to ask it because somebody did ask it and I'm sure people are wondering with all your training and everything you do, how do you get enough protein to be an amazing I eat a lot of like food. you are? You know, when people ask me that question, um, that they're worried about their protein intake, the first thing I recommend is doing a, um, keeping track of it. Like my fitness pal, going to talk to a registered dietitian um, find out exactly how much protein you get in your day. I think Americans in general are overloaded with protein. And I don't, I don't Amen. know anyone who really seriously is protein deficient. If you do, I'd like to, to meet them. Um, I think people generally think they don't get enough, enough protein because of the um, social media, because of articles, because of stuff they read. So, I generally, because I used to track it, um, I haven't tracked it in a while, but I get about 15 to 18% of my diet comes from protein. I'm about that 60 to 65% carbohydrate more when I'm training, and I'm at that 20 to 25% fat. So I don't know if that added up to 100, but it's pretty close. And my protein sources are right. um, my protein supplement shake, that comes in Shakeology or the Aloha, um, the beans, I mean, one cup of beans is about 16 grams of protein and I could sometimes eat two in a day, depending on my wow. training load. Um, there's protein in tofu, there's protein in tempeh, um, there's protein in, in plants, vegetables, there's protein in whole grains. Quinoa is a big, um, high source of protein and that's a whole grain. So I think I just want to educate people to keep track and, um, before they start overloading their bodies with protein, which is going to be excreted through your urine if you get too much, find out how much you are getting and how much do you need. Because I could tell you, if you walked around with me for a day, I mean, I didn't mention everything I eat, but I'm sure I'm in that uh, over 100 grams of protein a day on plants, food, plant-based eating. Right. Right. Yeah, I remember I posted um, on Facebook a picture of a mm -hmm. veggie stir fry over brown rice. So it was a big pan of stir fry, like t 10 different vegetables. Uh -huh. And somebody said, where's the protein? And every once in a while, people do that. Like I, I had corn for lunch one day and someone's like, well, where's the protein? Mm -hmm. And I added it up. The corn that I ate, like the whole, cause I ate the whole bag of it. It was 16 plenty. grams of protein. Yeah. And that's plenty for one meal. When you're eating six meals a day. And then, um, yeah, and then the same thing with the stir fry. I So I just go on my fitness pal. I add it up real quick just because I want to educate people as well. And it was 26 grams of protein right, right. in a veggie right. stir fry. You know, people, people are scared of carbohydrates, but they don't realize veggies are carbohydrates. Fruits are carbohydrates. You no, know, I think eating plant-based right. is all about well, eating non-processed foods. I'm not a processed food plant-based eater. I try to stick to whole grains, right. veggies, and fruits and, and my lean plant-based proteins. I'm not, I'm not as good as you in that world. I'm getting better. Um, but yeah, every food on the planet has some for some amount of carbs, protein, and fat, every single food. That's what makes up a food. Even if it's a trace amount. 
So it's interesting. So I'm glad that you um, said exactly what I believe too. I think it's more to it than that. (laughs) Yes. More to it than the protein thing. Um, so let me see. I just want to look through. There was, and the thing I think that's awesome about you, Wendy, when I was reading what people wanted me to ask you, I love it because since I know you, uh-huh. I already knew kind of what you would say, but I think it's good for people to hear that. I think people get too wrapped up in like the specifics, like somebody, you know, said, aren't we supposed to get 1.8? kilograms of protein per Mm -hmm. pound of body weight. You know, people are very in like they're, they're obsessed with those specifics that in the long run over, you know, a period of a week or a period of a month, it doesn't matter that one little specific thing, as long as you're doing everything in general, the way you're supposed to be doing it. It's a, the way it's, that works for it's you. the lifestyle, it's the accumulation it's and stringing together, uh, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, days of, of changes and lifestyle. Yeah. Overeating one day doesn't mean you're fat. Under eating, under eating one day doesn't mean you lost weight. It's, it's the accumulation. And, and, and I think a lot of athletes are into the weight loss, weight gain thing. So that's why I mentioned weight loss, weight gain. Um, Eating, eating good on one key training session, dialing it in one day, doesn't mean it worked. You know, you want to string together good days of dialing in your race day nutrition. You want to string together good days of, of eating until it becomes a lifestyle that you're happy with. One weekend or one weekend good or bad is not going to make or break your lifestyle. It's stringing together those days of health, health and wellness. Sleep habits, hydration habits, nutrition habits, training habits, mixing up frequency, volume, and intensity. I mean, there's a lot involved. Right. Right. So before we sign off, um, I do want, I like to give people some actions. You know, Uh I like doing things and getting things done. So I wanted to know what three actions so if you're if you're talking to triathletes out there, and probably we're talking um, more to people who maybe not very beginners, but maybe not elite. We're in, like that, like mm-hmm. you said, that beginning to intermediate phase. What three things could somebody do right now, whether it's changes in their lifestyle or uh, going out and doing something specific? What three very simple, easy tasks could somebody do right now to make themselves um, a better triathlete? One. Set a SMART goal, something that's specific and measurable, number one, and um, have a a time frame. So set a goal and set an end date for your goal. Set 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 an action plan for that goal. And that goal can be anything in your life. You got to start with the goal, create an action plan. And actually, before before you create that action plan, know your starting point. Know your starting point with your fitness, your health, your wellness to help you create that action plan. So pick a goal, something that is measurable, yep. specific, and has an ending date, a time frame. Know where know what your starting know point where is. Know where you're at. at. And then from right. there, and the, develop you can a develop plan a plan to get plan. To your you goal. seek out advice of developing a plan. You find a plan online. Um, you know, and, 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 and on this, on that note, someone asked me, what are my three, um, life lessons? And it, and I just like, oh crap, I got to think about this. But, um, my three life lessons have to do with live in the present, learn from the past because that past will help you set an action plan for your future goal. So you pick out your, you pick out the future goal, right? Learn from the past live in the present and set that action plan to your future goal. Those are my three life lessons at this point in my life. I'm still pretty young, Perfect. but I think it's very present very to be present. I think it's very important uh, to be present. Right. Right. Well, and, and, and you as a coach can help people with all those, all those three actions, 
um, your philosophies. So where can people find you if they want um, to get in touch with you? My website is www.t2coaching.com, small t, the number two, coaching, all one word. And um, on the upper right corner, I believe, you can just contact me. Um, my my email is actually t2coachwendy at gmail.com. There's a contact form. You can contact me through there. Um, I have all, I have everything on there. It's just a, it's a nice website. Okay. And if you, and, and actually, if you guys just Google T2 coaching, yeah. Wendy will come up. So that's an easy way to remember it. And um, I'll post this video, the recording, because a couple people, since we did have some technical difficulties in the beginning, um, a couple people have said in the messages, hey, I got to go. I'll catch the, re the recording. Um, so I will post the recording. I'll post Wendy's information if you guys want to get in touch with her oh. as well. Thanks for joining, everyone. Sound good? Awesome. You guys are awesome. Thank you, Wendy, so much. We'll definitely have you on again because in my four categories of life, my food, fitness, finance, and fun, you're pretty much, I would love you to could be. be a guest on all of those podcasts. So we'll definitely have, or I guess it's not a podcast. Well, I don't even well, know why well, it's also life. like just having one blab about nutrition and athletics, one blab about the mental aspect of training, which is right. so important. That could be a whole Q and A, um, right? That could be a whole like right. So there's a lot a of topics weekend. that I'd like to continue on doing a blab about. This is a good intro. This is just yeah. On the well, my, as my husband said, when whenever I'm like, oh, I'm doing my blab today, he's like, of course you are. That's what you do. Like he just thinks it's funny right. that it's called a blab because he says I talk a lot. So, all right, you guys, thank you so much for being here. And Wendy, thank you thank so you. much. I will Bye. see you guys next week. Bye.